Hello everyone, welcome to Scalers YouTube channel. And today we are gonna to look into the introduction to Google Cloud Platform. So this is going to be a series, so eventually we'll be learning other services, we'll be looking into compute, storage, database, and so on. So don't miss out on these videos, so you can just subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you get the updates for these videos. And before we move on, I just want to ask you guys one question. What do you think is the best or you think which is a better service than GCP or any cloud service. For example, there is AWS, there is Azure, there is GCP, there is Ali Cloud, IBM Cloud and so on. So whatever you think is the best cloud service with its explanation, leave it in the comment section and we'll discuss about it. And also, if you wanna learn about more technologies from industry experts, we are providing a free masterclass and if you want to learn from them, you can check out the link in the description or you can just go to the website scalar.com slash events. So now let's get started with the video and that is introduction introduction to Google Cloud Platform. So introduction to Google Cloud Platform. Yeah, so starting off with what is cloud computing. Uh, also before me starting off with this, there is also another video I've made on the same topic where it's in more detail about cloud computing rather than GCP and if you wanna check it out, the link is in the top. You can go ahead and watch it. Now let's get started. So. Cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. So to put it very simply, you are renting IT resources over the internet. You are renting computers, you are renting storage, you are renting databases. To give a very simple example, it could be Google Drive. So you are paying to get Google storage. You are basically paying Google in order to get storage where you are storing in their own servers. So over here, uh, GCP is more of a cloud platform where you get other kinds of services. Google Drive is a simple example which I gave. Uh, it's a software as a service because you don't get access to the code, you don't get access to uh, anything else, you just get access to the software online. You can create your account and upload stuff to it. But again, when it comes to cloud computing, you will be given access to the infrastructure as well if you go for the infrastructure services, right? And then instead of buying, owning, and maintaining physical data centers and servers, you can access technology services such as computing power, storage, and databases. So yeah, so instead of uh, setting up your own physical data center for your own company, you can just go ahead and uh, instead of buying them, you can just rent it from these cloud platforms. It could be AWS, Azure, GCP, whatever it is. And uh, it doesn't make a big difference in what cloud platform you're choosing as an individual for your own projects, but it will vary according to uh, companies. For example, uh, Microsoft is better suitable with their own products. For example, Azure is their own cloud platform and it's better suitable to their own native technologies. For example, if you're a, a C Sharp developer or a .NET developer, then it'll be very helpful to you in this case, but again, in AWS, they have their own set of services. And GCP is more of a free platform. All kinds of services work here because uh, Google ha has their hand in a lot of open source projects as well, like Kubernetes, Docker, and all. Okay, so now this is basically what cloud computing is. Instead of buying and owning your own infrastructure, you're renting it from another infrastructure company, like Google in this case, right? So uh, there are other examples over here. Cloud computing, you're accessing these services over the internet, that is networking, applications, security, data storage, and business intelligence. So any service you access over the internet is technically a cloud service, be it Gmail. Gmail is also a cloud service. It's just a different type of a cloud service. It's a software as a service. But in this case, if you want to host your own application online, then if you want to create your own server, in that case, that server application or that server tool, in Google it's called Google Compute Engine, and it is an infrastructure as a service because they are renting you the infrastructure itself. Now, why exactly do you need cloud computing? So first of all, what is cloud computing is fine, but if you can buy and set up your own hardware, and your own data center, why do you need cloud computing? To put it very simply, it has uh, benefits which on-premises or the physical data center can't provide. That is security, disaster recovery, cost savings, and flexibility. And these are only some of the benefits. There are other benefits as well. For example, you can uh, it's easily scalable as well. Uh, I'll explain what is scaling later. Now, first of all, security. Uh, when you create a, a cloud account for your company, you can create users and give them separate access. For example, there is a developer in your team. The developer only needs access to, let's say, compute engine and storage services. You can provide access to that user 
uh, to just use those services. And then if there is a data scientist and they just need access to certain data tools and data uh, analysis tools, then you can just provide access to those services. So you have these individual access settings for individual users. And also there is encryption at rest and also at transit. That is your data uh, will be encrypted at rest also. In, if it's stored in uh, GCP, it, will, it is already encrypted. And when it's also in transit, that is when you're copying or moving data from one service to another, it's also encrypted. Okay, so again, there are more data safety options that we'll have to go in depth. Uh, we'll look into it later in the uh, series. For now, let's just concentrate on the basics. And then disaster recovery, this is one of the uh, main reasons why companies shift to cloud, because when it's a physical data center, and it's already a huge capital investment, right? And in this case, if you want to set up multiple data centers so that there is a, a, a possibility of disaster recovery, for example, if you have just one data center and if there is a major outage over there, power outage, or if there is a natural uh, disaster in that area, if it's, uh, yeah, so basically any kind of disaster which happens in that area, your data center will be down. And if your data center is down, all your applications also will be down. They would not work. And that would basically be a problem to your company and your organization because none of your applications are running at the moment. But if you have multiple data centers, but again, it will be a double or triple investment in terms of this. That is just the upfront cost because you will have to find a place uh, and then you'll have to buy the hardware. You'll have to hire professionals to set this up. And also you need uh, maintenance professionals to maintain this data center. So it's an on going cost. But when it comes to cloud, they have their infrastructure all over the globe. It's already established. So if you have an application running in India, you can easily migrate it to US if your customer base is also growing over there. And you can also move it to Europe, you can move it all over the globe using cloud without even having to physically uh, be at that location. You can do it all with your laptop or with uh, any computer because again, cloud doesn't need a high performance computer. It's in the browser. Uh, and you are basically renting these services, so the uh, servers and the hardware, everything is in Google's own data center. So next comes cost savings. So there is something called pay as you go. You only pay for what you use. You don't have to invest a lot of money upfront itself. So basically pay as you go model is when uh, you use services and only pay for the time or the amount of services you've used. For example, let's say you've run a server for 10 hours, so you'll just have to pay for the 10 hours of that server running. Even if you stop the server for another 10 hours, you don't have to pay for the server when it's not running at all. And even though you've created it, you don't have to pay for it. You'll just have to pay for the time uh, the server is running. You'll just have to pay for the uh, storage that you're using. Let's say you're using uh, 10 GB of storage. you will have to pay for that. You'll have to pay for, uh, Let's say you're using multiple users and if there is a, a limit over there, for you creating users, there's no limit. But again, each user will be using different services. So again, each of those users will be using a certain amount of services. So you'll just have to pay for the cumulative amount of the time you've used each service for. You don't have to pay for creating them or deleting them or just using GCP. Right? That's basically pay as you go. You pay as you use these services. Uh, that's basically it. You don't need to put up any uh, huge upfront costs. Uh, for example, if you have to set up a physical data center, you will have to invest a lot of money in it. And to invest, you would need investors. You, your company has to have a lot of money in the first place. And if it fails, then it's another uh, big problem. But when it comes to cloud, you can just set it up without having to put any effort or without having to invest at the uh, beginning. But again, there is also something else. There are discounts which these cloud services provide if you take a long-term contract with them. If it's a one-year or a three-year contract, you will get bigger discounts. And obviously, as an individual user like you or me, we don't need that. But a company would need it. Uh, so basically, if you're working for a company, that would be a better deal, uh, for example, in the long term, rather than just using uh, pay as ego service model, right? Next comes flexibility, uh, more flexible than a local server. If you want extra bandwidth, you can just launch servers on demand. So to put it very simply, when you have a physical hardware, there is a limitation. That hardware can only run, let's say, 1,000 servers in it, 1,000 virtual servers. So you can't run more than 1,000 virtual servers. And if your company needs 
more than 1000 virtual servers, you will have to buy the hardware again, you will have to configure it, you will have to hire another professional to set it up, and you'll have to maintain it as well. But when it comes to cloud, you have the flexibility of increasing or scaling up the number of servers you require. Let's say you can vertically scale or horizontally scale. Th these are multiple scaling options. You can either scale uh, the server itself to become uh, like basically increasing its capacity by, for example, let's say this laptop just has uh, 100 GB of uh, storage. You can scale it vertically by adding another 200 GB to it. And uh, there is also another form of scaling, which is uh, basically adding more servers to it. Let's say your company is booming right now, is in a boom and currently you're already using 1000 servers and you need another 500 servers. If it's physically a data center, then you'll have to buy hardware and set it up. But if it's a cloud, you can just basically create these servers without having to go into any big hassle. You just ask for more servers and you just provide the details and it'll automatically create it for you, right? Okay, so this is flexibility and I also included scalability with it. And uh, one more flexibility is that you don't uh, get basically locked in. There is something called vendor lock-in. It happens when you go on a longer term. For example, let's say you take a one year or a three year contract with GCP, you're basically logged in for that period. You can't shift to AWS or Azure. You can shift, but again, you'll still have to pay the money uh, which you paid for that long-term contract, right? So this is basically what is problem, but other than that, it's pretty flexible. You can add more servers or remove servers according to your requirements. So this is basically the benefits. Some of the benefits, I've not even included all of them. And I've also tried to uh, talk about the on-premises. When I already talked about the physical data centers and what kind of uh, advantages it does not have when compared to cloud computing. So now let's dive a little more deeper into it and look into it. Okay, so there is on-premises and cloud computing. So in this case, if you look at these two diagrams, over in the left side, you can see it's a bigger iceberg. Uh, in the right, it's a smaller one, but the peak is similar to it. But again, uh, icebergs can be bigger below the water. But again, that's basically what on-premises is, because there are other hidden costs which you wouldn't know when you're uh, setting up your own physical data center. But when it comes to cloud computing, you don't have to worry about it because you know what are the hidden costs, because you are creating the services, right? Now, looking at this particular diagram, at the top, the 9% of the costs would be just software licenses. For example, if you're using Windows servers, you'll have to pay for the Windows operating systems. Or if you're using other softwares, which are enterprise software rather than open source, you'll have to pay for them as well. Now talking about cloud computing, at the very top, you can see the subscription fee takes up most of the cost because you will have to set up your account and then for the subscription fee, you'll just have to pay for what you use. And uh, when it comes to a company, the subscription fee would most probably be the discounted cost. For example, let's say you're using 100 servers and you want those 100 servers to be available for you for over a year. So for that one year, you will uh, basically book those 100 servers and that would basically be most of the cost. Just paying uh, this to the cloud platform would be most of the cost involved in this case and it will obviously be much cheaper than what you have to do in on-premises because when you compare the rest, uh, in cloud computing, you can see there is implementation, customization, and training. And uh, so basically, you'll just have to hire cloud professionals or hire freshers and train them in cloud, and then show them the implementation, show them the architecture, show them what are the products which are running on the cloud system, and then you'll have to, uh, that's it, once you trained the employees on cloud, that's more than enough, they will be more than capable of doing it, and there are certifications which uh, uh, individual person also can take up and train themselves. Mm, then, now when it comes to on-premises, underneath you can see, again, obviously there is implementation and customization in on-premises because it's your own physical data center. You have the complete ownership to it. That's one of the main advantages of on-premises. Whatever it is, it's your own hardware, it's your own data, it's your own uh, data center, so there is nothing owned by anybody else, it's your companies. So whatever is stored over there is your mission critical uh, applications data. So now that could be more secure than storing it on the cloud. But again, there is also something called uh, hybrid cloud model where they use a private cloud and also a public cloud. So what exactly that means is public cloud will have the website or the front facing application which the users can see. And the private cloud will contain the databases, it will contain your mission critical data, and you can connect 
these two using a peering connection or you can connect them using a VPN and there are so many other ways to do that. So that again comes, uh, that again it's a completely different topic. Now let's get back to this. Now there is hardware, you will have to keep, uh, you will have to maintain the hardware because hardware gets uh, physical data centers, uh, the hardware will get heated up and for that you will have to set up uh, air conditioning over there and then you need IT personnel in order to maintain this hardware, you need security professionals to maintain your data, you need uh, maintenance professionals to maintain these hardware and also software patching, fixing it and also training also is required to this uh, personnel as well. Even though it's your own company, it's your own hardware, you would still need to train your employees on how to exactly go ahead with using your own physical hardware. So the ongoing costs in this case would be uh, downtime, performance tuning, uh, ongoing burden on IT, uh, maintain or upgrade hardware, network, security, database, uh, performance tuning, applying fix, uh, fixes, patches, upgrades. So basically all of these are will come under maintenance uh, because whatever you do after that is basically maintaining it there would be a database software running and if it has to be patched or if it has to be fixed or if it has to be upgraded to the latest version and that should be done in all the servers which are running in your physical hardware and to do that you would need to have another uh, system for example you would need to have Ansible running and Ansible you upload the configuration files to Ansible and then it automatically uh, writes or it runs the script and it will install or update it in all the servers which are running over there. Right. So now again, these are the ongoing costs and you can see cloud computing as just one ongoing cost, which is the subscription fee. You either pay monthly or quarterly or yearly, right? That's basically it. That's exactly why people are shifting to cloud computing, uh, mostly mid-sized companies uh, and startups because startups and mid-sized companies would not have the capital to set up their own physical hardware. Major companies might set up or already have their own physical data centers and all also shifting to cloud. For example, Netflix, when they started the internet streaming model, they are completely in AWS right now. Every single thing, every single part of Netflix runs on AWS on the cloud and uh, YouTube runs on GCP. Gmail, all Google services runs on GCP. So basically that says it how cloud is very popular and also successful right now. Right, now moving ahead, we already looked into why do we need and what is cloud computing. And if you wanna learn more about it, I already told you there is another video introduction to cloud computing in Scaler's channel and we'll link it above and you can go check it out. Now, what exactly is GCP? So now if you understood what cloud computing is, it's basically what GCP is. GCP is just a platform which provides these cloud computing services. Cloud computing is the technology, cloud computing is provided to you by various companies and GCP is just one of them. And it's called Google Cloud Platform because the company which owns this set of cloud services is Google. Now, but why exactly should you go for GCP? There are other cloud services, there is AWS, Azure, Ali Cloud, IBM Cloud, but why GCP? Again, as I told you before, it doesn't matter for an individual. An individual can go for AWS or Azure or GCP because you are anyway going to practice the cloud. But, and also it depends on the company you're working for. If the company is using AWS, then you'll have to learn AWS. If it's using GCP, then you'll have to learn GCP. So it totally depends on the company or the individual's own need. But when it comes to a company, when you are running a company, in that case, it totally depends on what exactly is more beneficial to you. If your entire stack is on .NET, then it's better to go with Azure. And then there are certain things which GCP provides, which makes it uh, its own, for example, the world's biggest platforms, the world's biggest mailing service, the world's biggest uh, video streaming service all run on GCP and that, that just shows uh, they are on the top of their game, right? AWS had a head start, they started in 2006, Azure started in 2010 and GCP was able to start in 2011. So that basically the head start gave AWS that platform to make themselves the market leader. But even then GCP is growing really fast right now, right? Moving ahead. Uh, okay, so now again, one more reason for why GCP. They are in the leaders section as the other two, AWS and Microsoft Azure. These three have consistently been in the leaders section for quite a long time. And as of June 22, according to Gartner, they are also in the 
uh, leaders list. For example, just below that you can see Alibaba Cloud and Oracle Cloud. And to the left you can see there are niche players. There is Tencent Cloud. Tencent is a gaming company, uh, a Chinese gaming company. Then you know Hi IBM and also Huawei Cloud. You know Huawei is a uh, electronics and mobile company from uh, China, again. Uh, yeah, so basically this is it. And then it comes under leaders. So this is just to show that they are also in the top of the cloud game, right? And then Alibaba is actually slowly creeping up to the leader section and eventually they'll be there because uh, they are also providing uh, services and they are, uh, their Asian market is also getting wider and wider. Okay, so now coming to the next important part of why exactly GCP, global infrastructure. All of these cloud services pull their customers in by showing that they have a wide uh, infrastructure, right? So in this case, it's the same. So GCP has its own infrastructure running in 35 different regions globally, geographical regions. And in those 35 different regions, they have 106 zones. So zones are basically data centers. They are individual physical data centers. Each zone is one single data center. And they also have 176 network edge locations. So edge locations are basically to increase the speed of your service to a particular area. Let's say, uh, currently I'm in India, and let's say there is a food delivery service, and Bangalore uses this particular service more than any other city or any other place in India. So now, then Bangalore would require more uh, speeds. Bangalore would require more uh, bandwidth, right? So for that, you can have an edge location in Bangalore and so that the customers in Bangalore can directly access the application which is running in Bangalore will directly access the edge location rather than accessing the main server running in let's say Mumbai or Hyderabad or somewhere which we don't know. So that's basically what edge locations is and they have 176 of that across the globe and edge locations are important for highly uh, crowded areas. For example, New York, Manhattan, they also have their own edge locations because more people use uh, services in that particular area than the entire country. That's basically it. And then also it is available in 200 plus countries and territories. So all of the cloud services provide this. That is their cloud platform is available in every single country. Let's say you are uh, in a country in uh, Africa, let's say you are from Ethiopia, you are still able to access uh, Google Cloud Platform. You can set up your own company across the globe by just sitting in one corner of the world without having to worry about uh, expanding your infrastructure, right? And also uh, below that, they're just saying new regions are coming in Doha, uh, Turin, uh, Berlin, um, uh, Mexico, Malaysia. So you can just read that from here, right? Now looking into global infrastructure, uh, let's also take a look at the map. Uh, for example, over here, you can see this is US and Canada region. Uh, this is the Europe region. And uh, this is the Indian region, Southeast Asian region, Australia, uh, South America, and also uh, South Africa, right? We can see uh, there are regions. The blue ones are basically already built. They're available. The white ones are upcoming. Uh, and over here in India, we have in two different regions, that is in Delhi and Mumbai. We don't have any other regions apart from this. So if you want your application to be running uh, with low latency in Mumbai or Delhi, then you can go ahead with the GCP. And if you want to run, for example, your application can run in Mumbai and it can be still served to uh, Bangalore or Chennai regions. But again, to reduce the latency, you can use their edge locations. Okay, so these are just the locations. I just wanted to show you the map, how exactly the global uh, infrastructure works in GCP. And uh, you can see again, there is one more thing. In some regions, they have more uh, zones as well. For example, in US, they would have more data centers. And uh, let's say, let's take South Carolina or North Virginia. They'll have multiple data centers rather than just sticking to one single data center. That gives them more uh, availability and it gives them more durability to the applications which are running on them, right? Okay, so this is basically global infrastructure. We don't have to look much into it. Um, yeah, next comes one of the important parts for uh, individual user, for you or me, this is the most important part in GCP or any cloud computing platform, which is free tier. So free tier is basically certain services which are given to you for 
free without having to pay cost. Uh, so you don't have to pay anything for over a year. They also have their own uh, free services which are available forever. That is, let's say you create an account, there are couple services which are always available to you for free. And there are certain services which are available to you for free for uh, till 12 months. And also you get around $300 credit in your uh, GCP account and you can use that credit to uh, test out various services and you don't have to worry about uh, basically paying a bill, right? Okay, so now over here you can see there are various uh, services. There is Compute Engine, there is Cloud Storage, there is uh, GKE, there is Google Kubernetes uh, Engine, there is Cloud Build, Cloud Run, App Engine. And over here they have provided what exactly is free in this particular services. For example, when we talk about Compute Engine, uh, over here you can see it's one E2 micro instance per month. So one E2 micro instance every single month is free for you. So you can run one E2 uh, server or one E2 instance every month throughout uh, 12 months and it'll always be free for you. Next comes cloud storage, uh, 5 GB month standard storage. That is up till 5 GB cloud storage on GCP is free. Above that, let's say you have 6 GB of storage. So let's say you have 6 GB of storage, you'll just have to pay for that extra 1 GB above the 5 GB. It's basically like a free tier, so for that five, first 5 GBs, you don't have to pay anything. Next, big query, 1 terabyte queries per month. Uh, so queries which are retrieving 1 terabyte of information or 1 terabyte of data from a database is free. And then there are other services, App Engine, 28 instance hours per day. Basically, how exactly 28 instance hours per day? That is, if you just run one instance, throughout the day, you won't get charged anything because it is just 24 hours. But let's say you are running two different app engines. Then if you run both of them throughout the day, then put together, it will become 48 hours. Now that 48 hours, for example, that you will have to subtract 28 hours. Now you have an extra 20 hour of bill to pay. So make sure your usage when you're practicing these services are always below these provided free tier limits so that you don't have to pay a bill. Right? Or even if not then, if it's a free account, you will be getting this credit and it'll get subtracted from the credit. But if you don't want to get billed, make sure you are always within the free tier limit. And there are other services. If you want to check more about it, you can go to cloud.google.com slash free. Let me just go to that website quickly. And over here you can see, uh, you can run workflow, workloads for free, 20 plus uh, free products for all customers. Uh, you get free hands-on experience with popular products, including Compute Engine, Cloud Storage. There are monthly limits. You can go ahead over here and check all of this out, right? And then $300 in free credits. You get a $300 credit for a new account and uh, it'll be available for three months. And within that three months, you can run any service uh, and it'll automatically get credited or it'll automatically get uh, cut off from the $300 credit which you have. And then additional free credit for businesses if you verify your business email, which will help Google to get your business as a lead for them, then that also basically gets you uh, free credits. You can use that credits to practice your own services. Now, underneath, you have these free tier products. You can check out all of the products here. You can check out the limits of every single uh, free product under this. So that's why I wanted to show this to you guys. You can just go to this website and check more about it because there is not a lot to explain in free tier. It's just that there are various services which have certain limitations. And if you are within that limitations, then you don't have to pay any bill to use these cloud services. That's it. Now, uh, next comes the range, range of services. This is the most important part anybody would want to use cloud for. That is the services they provide. There are different types of services. There is compute, storage, databases. Even here, you can see there are data analytic services. There is machine learning services, artificial intelligence services, and so on. There is also IoT services if you talk about it. But again, for a beginner like you, let's say let's assume you're a beginner. So as a beginner, it'll be feasible for you to start learning from the very basic. That is, let's say a couple services from compute because compute is the backbone of cloud. Without Google Compute Engine, other services can't run because it's basically the most integral part of GCP. And next, there is storage services. Under storage, we can learn, you can see over here, there's cloud storage, there is persistent disk, there is local SSD as well. And then database storage, it's basically cut off from here. I'll open the website and I'll share more information about these services, don't worry about it. So uh, again, there is cloud SQL, there is cloud Bigtable, 
and then data analytics services there is bigquery ml there is business intelligence engine again under bigquery there is a looker uh, connected sheets and yeah so basically again there are some ml services here auto ml cloud translation so there are so many different types of services and to become a master in cloud you don't have to learn all of these services you just have to learn the services which you need for example let's say you are an administrator a uh, cloud administrator you would need to learn the services which help you administer the cloud if you are a developer you would need to learn the services which will help you develop applications which are cloud compatible so let's say you are creating an application that application should basically be able to run on the cloud as well so you will have to learn how the cloud services work you will have to learn the uh, software development kits provided by gcp so that you can implement it in your core as well so whatever i talked about right now is more advanced if you're already a developer if you're already an administrator then you can go ahead with this but as a beginner as i told you will learn the very basic services at the beginning so that it helps you uh, gain an understanding of how cloud works and what exactly it is right so now before moving on with this uh, in the next session in the next part of this particular series we'll be looking into compute services i'll be teaching you how to create your own virtual machine using compute engine and we'll also be looking into app engine and other couple services i'll just explain it quickly so this is what we'll be learning in the next session and moving further we'll be looking into storage databases and so on right so make sure you subscribe and also hit the bell icon so that you don't miss an update now opening this website so google cloud themselves provided us with a cheat sheet so usually we can build our own cheat sheets but them they basically provided us with that so you can learn about every single service with this one site which is google cloud cheat sheet dot with google dot com uh, anyway it will be available in the description below you can just go ahead and check it out uh, now looking at this you can see there are different domains so domains are basically the a uh, category under which a service comes so in this case the categories are there is compute there is storage there is database there is data analytics there is ai ml there are networking services there is devops ci cd identity and security application integration management tools there is also gaming services uh, there is mobile services which are which will be helpful for mobile app developers google workspace google maps platform api platform and ecosystems hybrid and multi cloud healthcare and so on there is retail migration to cloud so basically you don't have to learn all of this in order to become an expert at cloud that's what i was telling in the previous part as well for example let's say your company or your application uses google maps then it makes sense for you to come over to google cloud platform and learn these apis and how exactly to use them so you don't have to learn how the api is work because that's basically what an api is for you don't have to learn it how it works you just have to learn how to utilize it in your application so there is directions api let's say your application again let's take a food delivery application the food delivery application has to provide the directions to the delivery agent to where exactly your location is so they'll have to basically provide the directions from the hotel the restaurant to your house so now to do that you would need google maps and to use google maps you would need to utilize their api and to utilize their api you will have to use up google maps platform apis and in this case they would need to use the directions api right so if you need to use that you can it totally depends on what you want to learn but in this session as i told you we'll be learning the basics later we'll cover uh, more and more into depth when we move on to uh, the other parts of the series okay so now let me explain the uh, basic services quickly and then i'll show you how to create a gcp account and that would be the last part of this video because i just wanted to give you a basic idea of what gcp is and show you how to create your own account uh, with basically the free tier capability so that you can start practicing now under here you can see there is compute and under compute there are so many different services but again the most basic and the most important service is compute engine Compute Engine is basically a service which lets you create servers on the internet. These are not physical servers; these are virtual machines running within physical servers. Right? One particular virtual machine uh, can run in the same machine as another person's virtual machine, so it doesn't matter. They are basically isolated with each other uh, because they are two different virtual machines. For example, in your local PC, uh, let's say you have a Windows PC. 
in the Windows PC, you can run a Linux or you can run a Ubuntu environment. So to do that, you can install a virtual machine on your uh, system so that an operating system can run on top of another operating system. So that's basically the concept Cloud also has used. They have the physical hardware in place and then they have something called the hypervisor. And hypervisor lets you convert the details you provided into an image of an operating system. Let's say you want to create a Linux operating system and you want to use uh, Ubuntu. So now you provide all that information and the hypervisor creates a virtual machine which runs on Ubuntu and shares back the details to you. Now this kind of would be gibberish to you, so don't worry about it. In the next session, I'll be showing you exactly how this works with a demo. So that will be even clearer over there. But now if you are not getting it, it's totally fine. Next, there are cloud functions, there are app engines. Let me explain these two services also, and then let's move on to the next part, which is storage. Uh, cloud functions are basically event-driven serverless functions. To put it very simply, what exactly serverless here is, you don't have to create a server by yourself. Let's say you have a piece of code which has to run every time a button is clicked on your website, and you don't want to create a complete server in order to set this particular part. So instead you can use cloud functions, you can create your own function, you can put the code in it, and whenever that button is clicked, it will trigger the function, the function will run, and your desired output will be given back to the website. So now how exactly this is different from a regular server? So how it is different is, you just have to pay for the seconds in which this particular function runs. Let's say your code takes 10 seconds to run, 10 seconds to compile and build, like basically run and provide the output back. So that 10 seconds is your server ut utilization, right? Let's say every single day, 10 people are using your website and they are trying to run this. So assuming that it takes 10 seconds on average to run one single execution of your code, now it will be 10 times, that is it will be 100 seconds of execution. So now let's say uh, every second it costs you $1, it won't cost you $1, it'll be very cheap. I'm just taking an easy example for me to calculate. And so 100 seconds, $1, so you'll have to pay $100. So it's basically that easy because you just pay for those 100 seconds and that will be way cheaper than creating your own server and keeping it always running and paying the bill for that. I, I think you get the point over here. And next is App Engine. App Engine is a platform as a service. So Compute Engine is an infrastructure as a service. You get to decide the storage, you get to decide the amount of RAM, you get to decide what operating system which is running on it. But when it comes to App Engine, it's basically a platform as a service. They give you a website where you provide in all your details of your website and you upload your code. GCP automatically creates a website for you they automatically provision the servers, the databases, the required storage, whatever is required for your website. It automatically gets provisioned and your website is automatically hosted for you and a link or the URL for your website will be given to you. So in this case, you get a platform as a service, you get a website where you have all the details available. So you'll just have to provide. So let's say you want an Ubuntu system or you want a Windows system. You want a MySQL database running on the cloud, on cloud SQL. You want a 20 GB of storage allocation. So that is automatically provisioned for you. You don't have to sit and create this infrastructure. You just have to make sure your code is in place. Your code is compatible with the infrastructure you need on the cloud. So that, a, a, for example, let's say you're a developer and you don't want to worry about infrastructure that much, you just have, you just want to write proper code, then this is the platform which you want to use. And rather than using a uh, compute engine where you'll have to launch the server, uh, install the software and then set everything up, but that gives you more control over the tool. But if you don't want that much of control, you just want your website to be up and running, then go ahead with App Engine. Now there are other services, let's not look into that. Let's move, let's move on to storage. There is cloud storage, uh, there is cloud file store, there is uh, persistent disk, and then there is local SSD. So let me just give quick one-liners over here. Uh, cloud storage is basically a regular storage which lets you store objects. Objects can be anything. Objects are basically binary objects. So videos, files, text files, code files, everything come under binary objects because all of them are made of uh, basically made of binary files, right? So they're just ones and zeros. Videos, audio files, uh, images, everything is just ones and zeros. So whatever it is, you can store in object storage, which is 
cloud storage. And then cloud file store is NFS server. NFS is basically, uh, for example, let's say you want to attach a volume to your uh, Linux system, then this is the right one. This is not uh, cloud storage like where you can upload images or something like that. Next comes persistent disk. This is a block storage for virtual machines. So basically you can create a persistent disk and connect it to a co compute engine to increase the storage space in your virtual machine. Local SSD, again, you can attach local SSDs to virtual machines if you want to speed up the processing, but it'll cost you a little bit more, that's it. Now coming to databases, there is Cloud SQL, you can run MySQL or PostgreSQL or SQL Server on top of Cloud SQL. So it's already managed, so it's a platform as a service. You just have to choose what uh, database you want to use, let's say MySQL. You have to just choose how much storage you need, you have to basically create the tables and everything, so you don't have to worry about how it is set up, where it is running and everything. And then, um, Firestore is a NoSQL document DB. Uh, then if you want to know about NoSQL, we are also will be coming up with a video or it'll already there are many videos on our channel talking about NoSQL databases. You can go check it out. And uh, this is for managed Redis and Memcached. This is for uh, caching, this is in-memory storage. Uh, so again, for caching, it's a totally different concept. If you want to know about caching as well, there are videos on our channel, learn about it. Um, yeah, so basically this is it. Then horizontally scalable relational database, uh, cloud spanner. So I already explained to you about horizontally scaling and vertically scaling, right? And then AvoidDB, there are other uh, databases which we don't have to worry about. For basics and for a start, you'll just have to know about Cloud SQL and maybe a little bit of Cloud Firestore and that's it. So you just have to know about Cloud SQL to begin with cloud databases. And then there is something called database migration service. If you have a local database in your local system or in your physical data center, you can migrate it to the cloud using this particular service. Yeah, so now next there are more complicated services. There is data analytics and AI and ML. Let's not look into them. Uh, but networking is integral. Without networking, you can't create, uh, let's say you can't create uh, compute or you can't create storage because all of these services should run within a network. Even your local company, local area network, which is the LAN, has to be connected together. Without connecting them together, you can't share files between them. You can't uh, have authentication between them. You can't do anything, right? You can't do anything between them. Let's say you, if there is another laptop and I connect it using LAN, I can share files to it because it's a simple LAN connection. Similarly, within GCP, you would need a virtual private cloud which is called a VPC and uh, basically you would need a network within which you can launch these services or these servers. So let's say within one network, within one single uh, network you're launching four servers, they can communicate with each other, right? So for that you would basically need VPCs and there are so many other services within networking. There is NAT which is network address translation. That's a totally different concept. We'll look into it in the networking part of this uh, series. Um, there is DNS, there is cloud VPN, there is uh, carrier peering, uh, direct peering. There are so many other services. Okay? So if you look into them individually, it's very hard, but the one service which you require, uh, one service which you'll have to learn at the beginning when you're looking into networking is virtual private cloud because that is the basic component of networking. You create an isolated network within which you can launch your services, okay? And then there is uh, DevOps CI CD. Again, if you, this is only required if you know DevOps. If you're just beginning with cloud, then obviously you wouldn't know DevOps. Uh, you can learn about this eventually. Now, identity and, identity and security, this is also important. Uh, you can create users using this. So you can see cloud identity. There is uh, cloud IAM, which is the most important service uh, in identity and security. Using cloud IAM, you have, uh, basically it's called identity and access management. Identity and access management, you also get to manage what services they are allowed to use and more like that. And there are so many other services again in this as well. These we'll look at, uh, look at some of these later. Um, most of them you don't have to worry about because there are services which are very, very niche, which is just used for one single uh, tool and you don't have to even learn that even when you are basically into cloud, you can learn it when you actually require it, right? 
and then application integration you don't have to learn uh, learn about it management tools yes billing is required because without billing you wouldn't know how much you used how much you used in basically um, gcp there is something called cloud billing it's very simple i'll teach it to you uh, later in the session there is mobile you don't have to worry about it gaming you don't have to worry about it uh, google workspace again if you are working with uh, google drive or emails or uh, other google services then you can look into this otherwise it's not required healthcare retail developer tools yeah so these are more in uh, specific and more in niche topics basically let's say you are working in healthcare then you would need a healthcare apis if you are working as a software engineer in retail using gcp then you might need these apis right um okay so that's basically it uh, in this case by explaining about uh, gcp services and domains they provide you can also look it into the list view so again this link also is in the ppt and or it will also be provided to you in the description so you can go ahead and just have a quick walk through with all of these services now the final part of the session that is creating a google cloud free tier account so i already have a different account but i'm going to create another account uh, to show you how exactly to create one i'm not going to take you through the process because they would ask for my personal information and my payment details so i would not show them but i will show you the entire process of how exactly you can create your own account right now i mean here you can just open any tool for example free tier as soon as i click on start free it will take me to a page where i it asks for all my details for example here you can see it's just putting in my name uh, what country what best describes your organization um i'll just put uh, like you can put anything you want if you it's a, it's a company mail you can see you're eligible for 100 dollar extra in free trial as its uh, company mail um yeah and then you can just hit continue then it will ask for more information next it's asking the account type so it's basically a personal account for me even though it's on uh, the company's mail it totally depends on what email address you're using so but select the individual one again you can go for business one but again it's not required if you are uh, using this account to use these services for your business then go ahead with it or just choose the individual account and then provide the payment basically the card number i can't give it to you um tax information again just put uh, if you are registered individual i'm from india so there is something called the pan number over here we'll have to enter that and uh, yeah so basically that's it then you can just click on start my free trial uh, it'll ask for a small amount of money for example just 2 rupees or 1 rupee to verify if your bank account is uh, original account once that verification is done it will happen in like a couple seconds and once that is done you can start with your free trial you will be given 300 dollar of credit you can start working on google cloud as soon as this is done this is basically it this is very very simple once you provide your card details you'll they'll ask for the other stuff uh, other details of your card then click on just start my free trial and then you will be set so i will do this by myself and i will set up my account you guys also do this because it will be required for you from the next session on because from the next session i'll be showing you demos i'll be showing you various uh, tools and uh, techniques which you will have to follow for example in the next session i'll be showing you how to create your own server uh, on google cloud using compute engine and once you've created the server i'll also show you how exactly you can run a simple website on top of it and then you can make it public so once i make it public using the ip address of that particular server i will be able to view my website from anywhere in the world right that we'll be doing in the next session so make sure you set up your own free trial account if you're looking to learn and if you already have a gcp account you don't have to worry about this just uh continue from the next session so that you can uh, basically understand these services so that was the introduction to google cloud platform and before we started the session i asked you a question what do you think is the best cloud service there are so many different services so make sure you put it down in the comment section let's have a conversation over there and argue with pros and 
their cons. Now, let's do a quick recap before we move on. Uh, we looked into what is cloud computing and why do we need it? What is GCP? Why do we need it? And also we looked into the free tier, the uh, ranges of services which GCP provides, and also showed you how to set up your own free account. So make sure you set up this account before you attend the next session because there will be demos and when you want to do these demos and hands-ons, you would need a GCP account. So make sure you do that. And also to get an update when we upload our next video in this series, hit the subscribe button and also the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates or videos from us. So now that's basically it for today's session. Meet you in the next one.